back to Taking Your Health Back on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Wendy Lowe. Today on my show, we'll be discussing the silent leader, living with superficial cirrhosis with our special guest, Javier Supai. Supoy. Welcome, Javier. Uh, thank you, Wendy, for having me today. It's a pleasure and an honor. Well, we're excited to get started with you and just let the world know about SS which is uh, superficial siderosis. So let's start with you and your life as a kid. Where were you born, Javier? I was born in Cali, Colombia, South America. Wow. And so as a kid, um, you must have had some pets or animals growing up like every other kid. What did you have? Well, I had, um, uh, well, since I was a kid, I had, like you can see in the, in the slide, uh, a Pekingese. Uh, her name is Mimi. Oh. And uh, she was my favorite since I was like um, a few months old uh, of age. Uh, it was a gift by my mom. Wow, how special is that? You know, and I was just talking about Pekingese dogs because we don't see too many of them these days. But I remember growing up and uh, many people having Pekingese, and I think they're just adorable. So while you were growing up in Colombia, Javier, I know that there are many fruit stands and fruits are abundant, kind of like in Hawaii, but I know in, uh, in Colombia, it's even more abundant. So have you always loved to eat fruits? You know, I did. I love, I love to eat a lot of fruit and also they're very healthy. Uh, I'm not a, a real vegetable fruit, uh, eater. So fruits was my best way to eat a healthier life. Yes. Wow. And so of all the fruits, what's your favorite fruit? I have many favorite fruits, but if I have to choose a favorite fruit, it will be mango. I love mango. mangoes. Yeah, uh, I love mangoes too. Uh, and so, and then what is your most favorite vegetable? I know you don't care for them, but what is your favorite? My favorite vegetable would be probably lettuce. Lettuce? <laughs> okay, yeah. that's the easiest, I think. Least amount of... Uh, taste and flavors. Okay, so now let's jump ahead. Um, you're getting older in your days and um, I wanna talk to you about your college days. So I understand that you attended college in the United States of America. Where did you attend college and how was that experience for you? I attended the State University of New York and it was a, a lifting um, uh, experience because I graduated, uh, I skipped uh, sixth grade so I graduated at 17. So I was one of the younger sophomores entering my college days. And so it was an uplifting experience uh, all over, all around it. Wow. And how did you manage to study and get all that work in? It was hard, but I had a, um, I had a, a goal to always move forward and grow more of a person and so it kept me motivated okay so when you came to the u.s you were a young a young man and so did you speak english back then uh i did uh i am when i was in high school and in, in colombia i won on a scholarship and i was able to a scholarship to study english so i had more of a, i was at a conversational level in the english language absolutely yes wow so you came to the U.S. with a little bit of a, uh, an edge over the, a lot of others that just come because you could already speak English. Is that correct? Absolutely. It is correct. It was an advantage because, uh, but even though I was uh, in the ESL program, um, I had a uh, conversation at, a, at the conversational level. So it was, um, it, it helped a lot. Of course. Um, that, you know, going to school, I mean, like we local kids, we don't understand the, 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 I guess, the challenges of people or the kids coming from other countries. They have to not only be uh, with peer pressure and get um, associated with the styles and the culture and then the food and missing their home, but the language. You know, we don't even think how difficult that is. And that must have been so difficult for you, even with English as a second language and you being able to speak and compete with English, it still must have been very difficult for you, would you say, Javier? I, I would definitely say so because uh, even though I spoke English, I still had uh, a Spanish accent, a Colombian accent when I spoke the language because you don't use it as daily. So when you come here, they can tell that you have an accent. 
a, a Hispanic accent. So they right. they automatically know, okay, you're not from the US. So right. it was different, it was difficult to fit in, absolutely. Okay, so I'm gonna ask you this question and it's off the chart, but you know, there's a lot of different South American countries and you know, can are there different um, uh, accents from all the different countries and can you recognize like if a person is from Peru or if a person is from Venezuela or Colombia, can you recognize the different accents? Absolutely, absolutely. There's 33 countries in Latin America and you can tell who is from Cuba, who is from Argentina, who is from Peru. And even within our own country, we have 22 states in Colombia. We can tell who is from the north, who is from the south. So absolutely, you can tell the accents and the dialects, actually. Yes. Wow, that's amazing. So let's move further. I know that you did uh, attend the, uh, and graduated from State University of New York at Garden City, Long Island, New York. So what degree or degrees, as I've learned, did you achieve there? Uh, uh, one of my, my first degree, because I've always loved science, I got a degree in biological sciences and that gave me the, that opened the opportunity to do some things with it. And then my second degree was in radiation therapy, which was another goal that I presented to myself. Yeah. Wow. And so that's, those are not easy subjects, but so I, I've got to give you kudos and a pat on your back. Um, coming in as an ESL student, uh, uh, striving to be better and wanting more. And not only just getting one degree, you didn't settle on that. You went for another one. And so I'm just amazed and <laughs> truly amazed. And the perseverance that you have, I'm just, I'm so grateful to just know you. So I want to ask you, how is your life as a radiation therapist? Well, my love as a radiation therapist taught me a lot. It taught me the sensitivity, how sensitive our bodies can be. Uh, the sensitivity of enjoying life to the best and don't take anything for granted and try to keep, and I don't mean this in an indirect way or in a bad way, keep your vices away from you, smoking, drinking, drugs, et cetera, et cetera, because wow. that can lead to a lot of headaches. Right. And so that's, that's the key. I think that's what really um, propelled you on a straightforward line to getting your first and second degree, um, getting to where you are in life is because you didn't have such vices and such great um, advice that you're sharing with all that are watching and that those vices will distract many. And the fact that you have you didn't have those vices and look at what it got for you. And so as a radio therapist, I want to just ask uh, you, did that open many doors for you as a radiation therapist? It, it sure did. It, it opened many doors. Uh, it, it allowed me to travel the U.S. And it opened the doors that I was looking for, which was to look and change weather, the weather, because I didn't like the cold weather in New York. So, and one of the weather, that, that was the, the main thing. Uh, to open doors for me, and it sure did. It opened many, many doors, absolutely. Wow. I mean, and what a field to get into. And um, we'll talk about that later because I know we got so much more exciting things to talk about as far as your where you are right now. So I want to just ask you from the time you were in New York, um, I know you must have had mixed feelings about New York, but when did you arrive in Hawaii? I arrived in, the, in 1992 in Hawaii. Yes. Mm -hmm. Wow. And so how did that happen? I mean, how did you decide to become a part of Hawaii's paradise? Uh, I came to Hawaii on a contract for six months. Uh, the Queens Medical Center uh, brought me here. And then after the six months, I guess the Lord had a plan for me. And they all, there was an opening, a permanent position at the Queens Medical Center. And I took it. Wow. And so coming from New York, First coming from Colombia, then now going to New York. I mean, that's a whole another ball of wax going to New York. So not like Colombia, beautiful Colombia. But now you find your way to paradise, as I call it. And you must reflect that it has so many similarities, similarities to home, Hawaii and Colombia. 
So do you really love Hawaii? And um, what are your thoughts about just being here in Hawaii? I really, really love Hawaii. It reminds me of, of Colombia because to me, Colombia is another, another paradise. And just like Hawaii in the equator, same, same weather, same, very much costumes, the same, the same excitement, the same vibrant life that I was used to in Colombia. And I know the food is outrageous and um, just different flavors and um, just styles of cooking. Uh, I was very honored to have a, been a guest on a Peruvian ship and the Peruvian cuisine was out, you know, just outstanding. And um, tell me about a little bit about your, your Colombian dishes. What is your favorite dish that you miss back home? In, Col uh, in Colombia, we have many fine dishes, but my favorite is called Plato Montañero. And what it is, it's like a tray. It has rice, it has bean, it has like a chicken cutlet or beef cutlet. It has avocado, oh. it has an egg, and it's huge. And it's like, <laughs> it's huge. That's all I can say. It's like a little bit of everything <laughs> in one plate. <laughs> wow. Sounds nice and healthy, and that's the best part about it all. You have your proteins, you have all the colors. And that's the other thing is not only is it tasty, it's beautifully arranged. And I just love all the colors of the, the, the food and the culture. So now here you are, you've moved to paradise. You're having a great time. So I want you to talk about what happened to you in the year 2011 that turned your life 360 degrees around, Javier. In 2011, in 2011, I had decided to uh, go for my third degree, which was uh, uh, American Studies at, U at UH Manoa. And then I was like uh, two weeks within the semester, I started feeling dizzy. I started losing my hearing, having vertigo, having atasia, et cetera, et cetera. So I knew something was wrong. And between, I almost didn't finish the semester. And by the time the semester ended, at uh, the end of May, I ended up in the Queens Medical Center emergency room. Yes. And so you went there with all these symptoms and when, what happened, what did they tell you there in that, in that ER? Uh, well, I, there, I, there I, I arrived there as an emergency because I fell down on the street. So I was rushed to the emergency room. They did all types of scans. I told all the doctors that I had a tumor, they didn't find me until one doctor did a spinal tap and they noted that there was a hemorrhage to the spinal fluid in my spinal cord, which has caused a hemorrhage to the brain. And that's where the, the problem, the big issue, the big gigantic problem began. Wow. And so this gigantic problem, they already put a, a name to what you had with all those symptoms? Yeah. I, Yes, uh, it, uh, they 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 knew there was a we, we I was diagnosed with superficial cirrhosis in um in 2000 in uh, January 2011, but we didn't know the source. Mm -hmm. So this confirmed that I had a tumor, which I was right. The question is, where is it? <laughs> wow. And so, do you feel that your degrees in your you know in your studies and, and helped you to self-diagnose even before it was detected? Absolutely. I think that the fact that I knew anatomy and physiology and the fact that I studied a, a, the specific tumor that I was diagnosed with gave me the extra knowledge that I would concern my body that there was a tumor. And they did find it between spinal uh, lumbar number one and spinal number two, lumbar two, wow. two inch tumor. Yes. And so that was amazing too, because now you have these symptoms and you go to the doctors. I mean, the ER and, um, of course, with your, your medical knowledge behind you and guiding them. So, I mean, sometimes some simple uh, conditions and diseases, they can't diagnose, but you were, it was, it was a blessing in a way that they were able to, you, that you were able to come out of there with that diagnosis. I am just, I mean, right, it's, it's to have uh, the symptoms and the condition is one thing, but to put a name to it then that's when you can start even further researching. Am I correct? Uh, ab absolute, absolutely. It, it was at that time in 2011, they didn't know anything. So yes. when I was diagnosed, they didn't, they didn't say anything. 
Wow. And so, you know, living with superficial cirrhosis, how have you adapted your life while dealing with the symptoms of this condition? Yeah. It hasn't been easy since then, and it has. It was very devastating to me to go from being super active to not being able to hear, to be uh, to be dizzy twenty four seven, to be tired a lot. So it was difficult to and have a a, a cane, or, or for the most part. So it was very difficult to adapt. But I knew I had been chosen to be where I needed to be, and this is the beginning of that. Yes, and I also feel the same way that God has chosen such a strong, educated man that will understand what is going on with his body and know this condition. And remember now, everyone, it's not a disease, it's a condition and a condition that you you could self-diagnose and you could understand. So what what you know, does diet have anything to do with becoming stronger or mm, having the symptoms less severe? Like what you eat, does it really matter? Uh, I believe I have been very, very strong since I was a kid. And to me, that is part of continuing with life in, in hard moments. And also the fact that I've always been very inquisitive and also I don't give up. And also I'm very positive, very optimistic. And I find an excuse to celebrate life. And being a radiation therapist gave me a whole outlook of what it is to really enjoy your life. So this was like a preparation for this event. Wow. And you know, when I was doing a little bit of research on superficial cirrhosis, I know that they mention um, it's like a rust, a rust in that certain area. And so can you just elaborate on that word rust and why they refer to this condition as a rust in your body? Well, well our body has uh, a, a, a something that's called the brain barrier and allows, it doesn't allow anything to go there. The only thing that allows, that goes to us is viruses, bacteria, alcohol, and in this case, iron. And the iron is what was deposited in my, in my brain tissue, which became rust. And that's what the, that caused the damage to the brain tissue. Wow. So you would, um probably have to look into programs of detoxing and trying to get the metals out of your body. Is that correct? Is that something that you could do? Uh, I was placed in a, in a medicine that was, uh, they were trying it called Periprox. And in theory, it's supposed to remove the iron from the brain tissue. But in my case, it didn't do it, it caused more problems. So I decided, not to, I stopped it three months after. Wow. Wow. Luckily, you're one that listens to your body and not listens to just what they tell you to do. And that's very important because only you know what's going on in your body and they could pump everything into your body. And if you didn't, if you didn't deny it and stop it, you would be suffering and they wouldn't even know because you would have thought, oh, well, this is what my body is supposed to feel all this pain and this uncomfort. Um, so, but the fact that you know your body so well, and you said no to that, and now I know that you're going to take um, measures into your own hands, and that's why you stay so focused. Physically, you're active, and mentally, you're always being stimulated, and, you know, just just building yourself up, and I think that's your best defense, and as I, um, I asked you before, and you said your knowledge is so important here, and knowledge is power. And that's why you're going to persevere. And I know that you want to bring more awareness to more people out there. So I just want to ask you, um, and I want to ask you to please share your plans with us on how you will bring awareness of this condition called superficial siderosis. Uh, right now, is, we're still taking baby steps because uh, there's no... There's no federal funds. There is nothing out there. So my primary focus is to bring awareness to the state of Hawaii. As of today, uh, April two, uh, 6, 2020, I'm the only person with this condition at the uh, Neuroscience Institute at the Queen Medical Center. So I'm planning to bring awareness statewide, uh, contact the Hawaii Congress, the city council, the mayor, the governor, 
After that, I want to go national. And then after that, I want to go worldwide. Wow. And so I know um, when I asked you to come onto the show, you were very excited because it's part of your, your, your plan to start with being heard. And so we need platforms like this Think Tech Hawaii show that will bring to light more knowledge and information about superficial cirrhosis. And so as excited as you are that to be on this show, I'm very excited that you are here as well. And I also know that you did some uh, work for our, our, our new mayor, Rick Maggiardi. And I know that um, you worked on his campaign and you tell me a little bit about, I know that there was a video that you made while working with him. Uh, yes, I, I was in part of the, his campaign, which uh, began in July, and he I he got a very in, he got an interest in my condition, and he did uh, as an episode uh, living in Hawaii, and he wanted me to mention that so everybody that went into the website uh, rickbangliadeformayor.com can see it, and they took pictures and they talked it. it it talked about me and superficial cerebrosis. So that was the beginning, yes. Wow, and that's great publicity. I mean, to be on that platform um, and having the mayor, of course, <laughs> getting into office and learning about the different issues of, of all people, because it could happen to anyone. And I know it doesn't discern on color, race, religion, or anything like that. So good for you, just continue persevering. And uh, I know the word will get out and you're gonna help so many more people. So I wanna, I wanna, I have to put this slide in because on the next slide, you're shown here on the snow with a cane. I guess that nothing can hold you down. And then um, I just wanna ask how often are you needing to use the use of your cane? My cane, my cane is like my best friend. Uh, I use it outside when I'm outside 24 seven. It's like the best thing I could have, especially to, hold to it when I'm walking because I have the dizziness and the vertigo 24 seven. And the medication, which is supposed to help can also give a lot of dizziness. So that's my, my best friend outside of the home. Inside the home, I don't really need it because I'm always holding them to things. Mm, very good. So again, you speak of your buddy and I know we all need a buddy. So when I spoke with your buddy, Nate, he says that you're still very active and that and that shows us, all of us, your resilience, which inspires him as well as many others. So what keeps you going, Javier? What, what, keeps, me, what keeps me going is I, life is precious. I enjoy life. And I learned at a, in my radiation therapy years that life is very tangible. And there is no reason why not to enjoy it. And you need to surround yourself with beautiful people like Nathan, who has always been there with for me since 2006. Plus, I live in Hawaii. I mean, not everybody gets to live in beautiful Hawaii. And then I surrounded my, my I was given five years survival. I surpassed that. They said I would never walk again. I surpassed that. So I, I just love life. I love it. Wow. Yes. Hallelujah. And I know, you know, um, People out there, they don't know so uh, how much you just have to, uh, uh, how much of a struggle, I should say, it is for you to just even do this interview. Now, guys out there, he is deaf in one ear, and I want to say 50% use of the other ear, but yet he's trying so hard and focusing to hear the questions and the uh, conversation that I, I'm asking of him. So sometimes it seems like there's a drag time. It's because he's trying to hear it and process it. And you know what, Javier? Two thumbs up because you're doing a fabulous job and I know that God picked the right person because you got the right heart and if it wasn't in front of this camera I know your voice is even stronger and so that's what's really exciting is that you will continue on to get that that voice out so I want to just share with you that I met you uh, many years ago because you were, you like myself are very active with the Miss Hawaii USA and the Miss Hawaii um, pageant and so do you miss, I just want to ask you a personal thing, do you miss working with the pageants now that they're a little bit on hold? I, I kind of do, but uh, that's another goal of my life. I'm going to become a director for an international pageant in a few years. I'm working on that as we speak. Yes. 
very good. And that's exciting as well. So I, I, I know I sat with you and when he came to me and we were talking story, what was really neat is you see my beautiful brooch here. I know it's here. <laughs> my beautiful, beautiful brooch. He gave this to me and he didn't know that I like the color blue and I'm going to wear this as often as I can. And you're going to be right here with me in my heart. And I will be sharing your love and your desires to be more of a voice and encouraging and praying for you every step of the way. So if we don't talk to you directly, Javier, can you tell us how can we get more information about superficial cirrhosis? The, 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 best way, the best way to find out about superficial cirrhosis is to go on Facebook and look for Superficial Cirrhosis Research Alliance. That's the main umbrella. And then right under it is you go Superficial Cirrhosis Research Alliance slash Hawaii. That's where I may come in. But if you go to the main one, that's where you want, you will get every information about superficial cirrhosis. Or you can email me at Waikiki Latino at AOL.com. Very good. And you know, people, you've got his email address, go to the Facebook site and get this information because if someone, you know, uh, has some questions about what they're experiencing, if they have these kinds of uh, side effects or symptoms, please feel free um, to just source Javier because that's his heart. He really, truly wants to be there to support anyone that is or think is experiencing something like this. So I'm just going to have to say, Javier, our time is over and we're going to have to leave everything right here. But uh, you've been watching Taking Your Health Back on Think Tech Hawaii. Today, we've been discussing the silent bleeder with Javier Sapoy. Thanks for participating, Javier. And thanks to our viewers for watching. I'm Wendy Lowe. We'll be back in two weeks with another edition of Taking Your Health Back. Aloha, everyone, and mahalo, Javier.